Hello, hello everyone. I am going to try and add Rachel for our talk, tribe talk with. At wondrous sound. Hello Nathalie, hello Sophia, hello Randa, Rachel is here. <laughs> hello. Hi, Hi Rachel. What's Hi, the name Mike. of the cat? I think I've seen the cat on some videos before. Yeah, this is Mooney. She lives Mooney. here with us. She's been in the monastery for about 10 years, so she's very enlightened. She's very enlightened, exactly. I am going to thank you to start with for joining the tribe, the tribe talk. Today it's with Rachel, but uh, my introdu introduction to this talk is a bit long, I have to say. There's so much to <laughs> say. So Rachel is actually connected to us direct from Plum Village. And Plum Village is a mindfulness center. But really, this is a monastery. You are probably the only, I want to say, civilian surrounded by nuns in a monastery in the southwest of France. That's a Buddhist monastery. Yes, exactly. Uh, Plum is a Buddhist monastery that was founded by Thich Nhat Hanh. He's said to be the father of mindfulness. And today we are going to talk about something that seems very wide and not very, a bit nondescript, which is living your truth. We could have talked, we could have called this talk um, Becoming Yourself, which for me, I think, is the goal of any human being on this earth, but this is arguable, I don't know. So this is a big subject, this is a bit, this is a big philosophical subject. I'm going to introduce you, Rachel, for a second while you're cuddling Mooney. Thank you. Because you've done so much in such a short time that it's very difficult for me to introduce you properly. So let me try not to forget anything. So you started your life as a, an award-winning athlete. Uh, I think that you were just 22, actually, when you were recognized for your policy changes for adults with disabilities. Am I correct? That's correct. That's correct. You're also an independent artist, a musician, and you've put all of this together and you created Wondrous Sound, which yeah. was of the, the way you described it, you said this is Wondrous Sound is the love child of a life in music and law and social justice advocacy um, exploration, and through exploration of practices that bring awareness, connection and healing to ourselves and the world. So this is a big one. A Thank big you one, for yeah. being It is a big one. It is a big one. How are you? Yeah, very How's good. Honestly, yeah. Yeah, well, it's our lazy day today. So every Monday, we get to do nothing, basically, as a deep practice of stopping. <laughs> Obviously, I'm doing this. So I'm, you know, maybe I've lost some points there, some mindfulness points. But it's also a day to do what we love, you know, and to allow ourselves to explore that. So I love talking to you. So it feels like yeah. a good lazy day use of time. Oh, I just saw that I kind of have a, a bit of an aura here. Is it you like... do. Ah. <laughs> that was not. I actually have struggled to find some proper Wi-Fi to do this talk. This is what I just did. So, Rachel, tell me, how does someone like you, who has been trained in law, um, really is an activist at heart and a musician? And we met in a sound healing training as well, which yeah. you kind. Of brought all of these together and today you are in the monastery so how does someone like you get here yeah it's a good question um a big one doesn't help oh yeah well i think well i think Thich Nhat Hanh, as you've introduced him you know 
I really resonate with that guy, you know, his life. So his life, he was really kind of rebel in terms of not following a system that was laid out to him, but really following his deep intuition and his heart and what he saw society needed at the time. Um, and as his life has progressed, he's, he's responded to society's needs in different ways. So, and I think the things that attracted me to his kind of teaching is all the elements that I feel are, are in me. So he's creativity, first of all, because that was how I began. My life was really focusing on music, yeah, and expression through music and sound and rhythm. And he also, you know, has spent his whole life kind of expressing his insights through poetry, you know, really profound and beautiful and simple at the same time. So mm -hmm. in this place, it's very creative. We have, a, we have time, you know, for that. So as, as an artist, you know, it's, it's a really great place to be. I'm always writing music here. And, um, and then the second thing is his activism. Yeah, so yeah. his kind of engaged action in the world. So this was also part of my own journey of, you know, I was actually Vietnamese. He's actually Vietnamese, sorry to interrupt. He's Vietnamese and he was involved, obviously he was an activist against the Vietnam War and he was also nominated by Martin Luther King Jr. for all his work regarding the, the Vietnam War. Yeah. yeah, for the Nobel Peace Prize. And that's mm. it. I mean, what a, what a guy to be. He was excelled from his, exiled from his own country for 40 years for calling for peace. You yeah. know, I just think, wow. I mean, it's such a beautiful thing to do for humanity at the expense of his own life, really. His own people, his own mm. connection, often think about the sacrifices he made to follow his truth, you know, to follow his deep kind of insight into what what we can all do, what we have the capacity to live in peace and understanding each other in harmony. So yeah, that really moved me, his kind of action and his his call to leave the monastery because he was saying, you know, they were practicing sitting meditation in the monastery. Um, and he was a young monastic then, but there was villagers who were, you know, starving. There was people who had nothing left. The bombs were dropping and he felt, I have to do something. You know, yeah. you can't practice compassion. We have to actually act in yes. that energy. So this was very inspiring for me to see, you know, that we, yes, we need to take action in the world. But I think the final element for me was that I was doing that for, yeah, about a decade. I'd moved from music to, I, I started doing voluntary work at Coventry Refugee Centre when I was 23, because yeah. I also had this feeling of wanting to kind of serve society and knowing I had a lot of privilege and how can I use that, you know, in connection yeah. with others. Um, and at the time, I've kind of come full circle now, which is lovely with Wondrous Sound, because at the time I could see, well, I'm having fun, I'm a drummer in a punk band, I'm having a great time, but it's not really helping anyone, you know, it's not really serving life. Mm. I think now actually it was because I was happy and it made other people happy. So I can now see, you know, energetically, it was also positive, but I wanted to engage in the world in an active way, um, which led me to study law. In that just by being happy, you already serve the world then. Exactly. This is a deep mm. insight that we're encouraged to see when we're here at Plum Village. Mm. Um, but I couldn't see that then, for sure. I thought no. I had to do something for others, you know. And, yes. and I, and I, and I realised at that time that the, the use of law was a real tool and a power. And I was on the phone to, like, the Home Office trying to secure housing for people, food tokens, and I could see that often people would be denied their rights. But if I understood their rights, I could... I could help them more effectively. So I decided to try and get into law school with kind of no academic background, which was a fun trip. Um, but then I did the end. Amazing. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just to round up, you know, yeah, the story of my life. Then, then I, but then I burnt out, of course, because when you work on the front line, seeing suffering every day and how unjust the system is, and and with a lot of energy to change, 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 to secure rights, to honour people as, you know, 
equal living beings that, that we all are on this planet. Um, without this practice of being in touch with my own energy, you know, without awareness of my own needs, my own capacities, and the fact that I don't need to do all these amazing things to be loved. I just need to offer what I can with what I have in the moment. And that's enough. You know, I didn't have that awareness then. So yes, I achieved things and it was good, but I just burnt myself out. And then just luckily for me, I discovered Thai and this place at the right time, which as I say, brought all these things together, but with the practice of mindfulness. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. So all of this talks a lot to me. I had a burnout myself. I spent 20 years like in a, in a business that I loved. That was not the question, but I was very far from all these questions. I've always kind of been a militant, not an activist. And I kind of blame myself for it, for not having been able to take action. And I think this talk is also for all the people like me, because I think, unfortunately, we're a majority. We're we would like to see, like, I have this conversation with my friends, like, where I would like to see a life without plastic. And I would like to see a life more like this and more like that. And I have such a hard time implementing those little things. And, and I kind of still have a relationship that's very conflictual with myself. Oh, you should do this. Oh, you should do that. And, and so somehow everything you say is, obviously extremely empowering so i know we are not there yet but it's almost like i want to ask you what's your take on that of like the lack of activity of blaming oneself for not doing for not living their truth mm. and how do you give it like you know yeah well what i realize more and more is firstly blaming ourselves and anyone else doesn't help anyone like I mean, I'm not saying I'm some awakened being. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just living this life and learning what I can. But I think what I can really see is the energy behind our actions matter. The thoughts we have matter. The speech we use matters. And the action that we mm. take, whatever it is, whether it's using a bamboo toothbrush, you know, or, yeah, changing policy, um, the energy behind that action matters. So I now see that, you know, if I'm just really angry at myself for not being good enough at, you know, reducing my use of plastic or if I eat cheese sometimes, you know, if I'm just then this angry kind of monster, I mean, what are we actually trying to save the planet for? Just to all be yeah. angry together about, you know, no, it's to live, you know, in this sense of wonder and peace and connectedness and happiness. And I think, you know, Ty says something like, there's no way to happiness, happiness is the way. And it's very much about this energetic foundation underneath everything we do. And I think it's about having a lot, like a huge amount of compassion for ourselves, for our habits, for the society that's fed us this life, you know, like, you should do this, you should do that, you should do this, that isn't connected to this deep knowing and ecology that we're all connected and our actions actually matter and it might not be serving life to do things in a certain way so we're just waking up together slowly you know and it's just about being patient I think with ourselves having an aspiration to go in this direction but being very gentle and patient with ourselves and then we can be that way with others as well because another part is like I know for myself it is painful like waking up is painful when we start to see the suffering we're causing ourselves and others and other people and others. But again, you can't yeah. force anything, can you? You can only inspire people by your own life. And we need to have space for, for people to change in their own time through their own insights. Yeah, I think. So for example, I'm very negative and I'm not happy to be, but I'm very negative about the world that we live in right now. I'm very concerned. For me, nothing works. Be it health, like our approach to, you know, I see poverty rising. I, I have very strong political opinion. I, I just went onto your website and you were, there was actually a video of an interview of Satish Kumar, who is an activist. And I think he was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he was in, interviewed at Plum, actually. 
and he says that That's he has right, yeah. he has a dream of Gandhi talking to him and telling him you have to and you can't escape from the world which is really what i feel like doing i feel like ex <laughs> escaping i feel like going in like a cave i feel i don't trust human beings anymore i'm afraid of this vaccine i'm wondering why you want to vaccinate me i don't know the consequences of it i'm not yeah. sure what are the ultimate motives of the politicians and and i find i think i have a 16 year old daughter as well I feel like her education is entirely different from the one I, we had because uh, like the collective unconscious, really I started to understand what the collective unconscious meant, you know? Mm. She's like, why do I need to go to school if the world is going to collapse tomorrow because we don't take care of the environment and things like that. And I don't really see, I do see some people trying hard, you know, but I feel as a result, I very often have a kind of a reflex of like wanting to escape from the world. And Satish Kumar in this video you posted on Wondrous Sound on your website, is saying that you do have to engage with the world instead. And I find it extremely painful right now for me because everything affects me emotionally so strongly, you know, it's yeah. like I feel you know, I was watching a documentary called Seed, Seed about Seed, about how we just, you know, killed it all. And, and I have tears coming. And, and so this is where your life inspires me or what you learn every day at the monastery. So mm -hmm. is there anything to help me out? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I was I posted that video on my website because it inspired me so much. I was actually there in kind of the front row with Satish. And I'll never forget it because I couldn't speak after it. It was just that man, what an incredible being. And his yeah. whole life, again, was his message. But what he says there is, is the same thing of like, he was like, I've never burned out. I'm 83, 84, and I've never burned out. And he said, because... He was acting from a place of love. Yeah, the energy of love, the energy of giving from his heart without trying to control the outcome, without actually giving a toss what everyone else was doing, just I'm going to act from my power, from this place of love for all beings, with trust and with accepting whatever happens, the consequences, maybe I'll end up in prison, maybe I'll do this. I mean, big, big statements and not just a statement, he lived it. But again, this really woke me up of like, yeah, it's true, you know, because and and also to say, like, if you're feeling overwhelmed, you don't have to engage with the world. You have to engage with that overwhelm first. You have to give yourself permission to rest, to stop, to take care of of what's arising in you first. You know, that's another thing that we learn here. Um, that is the first thing practice. Sorry. Sorry, Rach. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. And also we have this misperception that we are separate from the world. Um, but actually, by you taking care of that anger and fear and overwhelm in you, you are taking care of the world because you are the world. You know, it's not outside of you and it's going to impact the world, at a, you know, at a kind of co collective consciousness level energetically, but also in you you're going to smile at the person you see when you walk out the door. You might be more open to someone who doesn't agree with you and not cause a conflict. Like, you'll have more space, you'll have more positive energy, and that is going to have a positive impact. And then it's not to say, okay, so just be on, on an island or in your cave for the rest of your life. But for me, it's really about tuning into our needs in the present moment. So maybe go to the cave for a week but then come back with renewed energy and take some action, you know, it's in, and find that flow, you know, of, of what you feel you can offer without attachment to the outcome, without thinking, oh, but the whole world's going to end. So what's the point? There is a point. Everything we do matters. Mm. That, that reminds me of the concept of detachment that the Buddhists, uh, the Hindus as well, are, you know, quote unquote, raving about. And it took me, it took me three years, or at least I don't know if I understood it yet. But it was so, and detachment for me was 
kind of I heard oh you need to detach yourself but you you can still stay involved mm -hmm. and the nuance there of like being detached and yet involved was extremely difficult for me to grasp and it's only when suddenly something happened or like all these you know rumbling in my head came together and I felt like I wanted to give the word uh, acceptance acceptance yes. synonymous to detachment mm -hmm. and being the, of the outcome yeah just exactly. earlier you know and how do you are, how are you detached from the outcome and and can you actually accept that you do not control that even if you smile to someone they might you know send something completely different to you and accept it exactly and allow it right yeah and that, that's freedom to me exactly that's freedom there yeah i see yeah <laughs> oh my daughter joined i told her about you very much she wants to be a lawyer yeah that's brilliant and an activist lawyer, I think. So here you go. One sec. Hello. I know it's late, but can you have no more clothes for me to, to wear? So I, I, no problem. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, sister. So I just had a visitor. So tell um, us about your life in the, in the monastery, because I was very surprised to see that you are extremely busy, honestly. Oh, yeah. Non-stop busy. What I forgot when I introduced you is to say that you actually define yourself as well. You get you give yourself the title of pot washer, professional yeah. pot. Washer. I'm a professional pot washer. Yeah, I am. About oh, this, I'm an international pot washer. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So how's the life in the monastery, and why you become a professional pot washing girl? Sure. Yeah. So, well, I actually became a professional pot washer before I came to the monastery, but then it was coming to the monastery that made it, like, took it to another level. So, again, it's this a thing of living our truth. Like, I, I studied law and I wanted to work in social justice. And there was at that time when I began funding to help people become something called, um, I can't even remember now, legal aid lawyer. So you would work on issues like housing, benefits, basically helping people who had no money and the government would fund you know not much but would fund a lawyer to help you yeah. you know address your issues and I was kind of up for that but by the time I finished my degree all of that funding had gone it was unfortunately when the conservative well, I, th I can't remember I think it was the conservatives came in or there was a huge political change in England um, and so then I was left with the choice of like well I can either try and wing it as a kind of corporate lawyer, but I mean, it's not going to be good for me or anyone else because it's not who I am. And, and I'm not that good at, at that stuff, to be honest. I, I like people. I like, I'm driven by the energy to, to serve yeah, people in those situations. So I realized that's not going to help because some clever people and fair play to them do that for a bit. You know, they get their funding through the corporate world and then they move in to human rights or go back. Um, but for me, I decided to wash pots. Yeah. So I kind of graduated and I'd worked so hard. I'd managed to squeeze a first class, you know, because thinking that right. And maybe, you know, it will give me more opportunities because it's so competitive. And that was pushing me, pushing me um, because I didn't have lots of money behind me. Um, but then, yeah, I just decided to, I'm going to wash pots in this really lovely cake shop and volunteer at the local law center where I would have hoped to work as a lawyer um, and just slowly work my way kind of up, which I did. So I was volunteering as a casework assistant and then I was on reception and then I started doing some outreach advice and then I got into advocacy. And then I kind of had this passion for bringing the use of law and human rights to the front line to advocates who might not normally have that knowledge to kind of empower that sector, the voluntary sector, the community sector. So that worked That's out beautiful. well. Yeah, that was really cool. And that was my journey. But then, as I said, I had this kind of mega burnout and I ended up in Plum Village, um, which is another story, but I made it here. And then I was pot washing again because basically every time we have a retreat, this is in the summer in particular, there's a beautiful family month long retreat. 
And in order to kind of have a kind of circle of support, what they do is they, there might be 300 retreatants in each center. So there might be a thousand people here for a week, um, and, um, which is amazing. But obviously if you're here on your own or even, you know, which is how I turned up, you need like your family you needs like some people to share deeply with. So they have this wisdom of putting everyone in a group, a small group where you will kind of share together every day, how you practice, what's coming up for you, um, yeah. your joy, your suffering. And you'll also have a task, a kind of community task because the community is run by all of us. And so my task was pot washing and I was to lead this family in that practice. So everything we do, we're invited to do as a meditation of being present with what we're doing. But I just loved it because I was like, wow, you know, it's so much fun. You're with people. And um, I guess if I'm honest as well, it's quite playful because you're with the water. It's the summer. And as a, a drummer, I'd like to play the pots, you know. So we were kind of mindful, joyful, mindful. Um, and yeah, I just got really into it. And especially with this burnout brain of kind of, you know, trying to, I don't know for you, but for me, it came from kind of being in this very political situation and trying to find the right thing to do, which does just yeah. burn out the brain because there isn't actually one, you know, right thing. It's just, it will serve one thing and not the other. And you have to just, you know, follow your heart. But, um, it was such a great healing process to just be with the pots in the water feeling the water cleaning their next thing and just bring all of my attention my body my mind to that process with people and yeah this I've not is, looked back yeah this is really the the subject of this talk because when you are you just described it beautifully you know you learn law and you're you know, there's the, the avenue that everybody's going to take or everybody's... And actually, you had this insight into yourself to know what was not for you, mm. what was for you. And, and this is where our talk comes in. Because living one's truth is actually not easy, I assume, right? You had no, to face easy, yeah. your, your environment. It's like you present yourself with your identity. And when I say identity, I mean... You're the daughter of such and such parents, of a history, of a country, of a language, of certain values. And comes a time where you kind of have to break free. I mean, bring along everything that serves you. But how difficult it is to break free from a certain, um, I want to say, education. Or we are the product of our surrounding and Mm. The influences like our society has around us and to jump into something like that's another example of this I know I have a cousin who you know was so perfect and and studying and getting the good grades and being in the right school and and then she comes out of it and she has a first depression and then she has a second depression and right now she's in um mental hospital for the last four weeks and they give her they give her morphine and they tell her that she needs to take the rest of the realized x and y uh, drug and i see the parents at a complete loss and and who wouldn't be because the breakdown the burnout you're talking about can have extreme you know can take forms that are completely extreme and self-destructive and my instinct is to say, this is wrong. Just go to Plum Village and, and wash some pots. <laughs> and, you know, um, but it's really what came into my mind because you and I had talked and I thought, yes. how, do go, how do we go back down to enjoying the smallest things we do and not exactly. wanting more others exactly. and, and trying to fit and try to to please everyone. So exactly. how was your, because you do have a history, a personal history, I don't want to, you know, but what brought you to Plum and how did that help you with the burnout and breaking free f somehow from expectation that your, closed, your closest one might have had from you? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, it's a big, <laughs> it's a big question, but I mean, I just try and answer like. Oh, what comes up. Oh, too big. I'm not making it easy for you, am I? No, no. <laughs> I mean, I think firstly, why I'm here in the first place was yeah, this I could say it was a combination of things. I've always been interested in like life you know in, in it i guess you could say a deep way i don't know but i was raised in a religion actually and in a kind of community setting and but i was allowed to make my choice to leave you know if i wanted to and I, when i was 12 i said to my mum and dad I, I don't believe in god um i don't want to come anymore but and they were like that's fine but i think it gave me you know i read the bible growing up so it gave me like that there was these paths you know that we're taught that there is this kind of wisdom out there and there is this mystery of life. And like, I always had an, a yearning to understand that and not really in a kind of existential way, but just like, okay, I'm alive. How can I live well? How can I help other people live well? Like we're here. So I don't really care why we're here. Actually. It's more, what can I do with this life that I have, you know, that that's positive. Yeah. Um, so I always had, I was always reading, my friends make fun of me because I had like I lived in this tiny studio just before I kind of five years ago I, I, um, before I embarked on this part of my journey and I would all I had one chair and then I'd always be buying and reading books like philosophy and sociology and um, my friends would laugh and be like are you in your chair you know reading on my own you know and it wasn't until I discovered Thai um, that I found a teacher who was alive, first of all, you know, a lot of the people yeah. that I really liked were long dead and Me also too. not just alive. Yeah. But there was a place to go, you know, and where other people might be like me who had this yearning inside to, to there's something more, you know, that we can learn and, and offer the world. So that was already planted. There was already that there before the burnout, you know, there was already yeah. that kind of thing. And then also in my own life. Yeah. I mean, I don't fit in. I've never really fitted into society. I'm gay, which is the first thing that was a big part of my own life, you know, knowing mm. and feeling different from a very early age. Like um, I said, we were sharing about this, but I think I was about nine when I realized that I don't know if I was a, knew I was attracted to women, but I knew that I was there was something that I was different. Um, mm. And I remember feeling like, well, no, there's nothing wrong with gay people, but I'm not gay. Like, I remember thinking in my head, yeah, but I can't be. I can't be, but I mean, I, I am. And and um, and then that took me time, you know, to, to kind of accept in me and to share it, share it out. Um, and I think that had a big impact on me as well, like feeling different, not fitting in with what was around me. Like, I didn't know any gay people. My parents didn't know any gay people. It wasn't like now, which is amazing to see, like on Instagram, you know, there's so many people like role models so that we can look and say, okay, I'm part of society, you know, I'm yes. part of the whole, because that's what we are. We're all, we all belong just as we are. But when I was growing up, there was just this very rigid idea of what we do, what we are. And I didn't fit into that, you know, yeah. in terms of, I mean, yeah, my sexuality. And then also my aspirations, yeah. I think I always, I'm not a monastic and I'm not on that path, but I do really have this deep feeling of like, my life is like to serve life. It's not just for me, you know? Um, so that I, probably... very, I thought like, for me, it was like a, a mixed Jewish Catholic. And I, so many times in my life, I thought it doesn't work for me. I have to become a nun. And at the same time, I knew I would never become a nun. It was also impossible but this call for something bigger, you know? Yeah. And not know what to do with it, but, uh, and not fitting really as well in many ways. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure we're not the only ones. Um, yes, sorry, go ahead. But yeah, no, but yeah this is it. But it's almost, again, I almost feel like it's another coming out that I'm realizing now. So then, but I also always longed for love as well in a, in a partnership, in a relationship. And I've had some like amazing relationships in my life, but I've also spent a lot of time on my own. But I could also see and say for myself that the, it was never quite fitting for me, really. You know, there might have been a period of, you know, something that was aligned, but really I wasn't, I wasn't sort of, 
confident enough, accepting enough of who I was deeply in order to love myself so much that I could offer love to someone from a place of deep acceptance and not clinging, attaching. I would even say, you know, almost control and fear-based of losing them, you know, and maybe I wasn't expressing that, but that's what I felt inside. And so this was another thing that I could really say, I don't, you know, I've not, you know, I think a lot of people mm -hmm. in a good way, maybe they're just happy. They don't end up in a monastery because they've just, their life has flowed and maybe there's some kind of, there's a happiness there. But for me, there was a deep suffering, a deep longing um, that I could never quite meet, yeah, in, in, in my romantic kind of endeavours and also in this life that society presented me. You know, this is what you do. Um, and I and I just thought, no, it's not what I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna do. <laughs> Did you learn true love there? Yeah, well, I mean, it, this is the beautiful thing. It's a practice, you know. And um, we have these mindfulness trainings, which are basically the Buddhist precepts, but interpreted by Thich Nhat Hanh in a kind of updated way. Um, so instead of them feeling like these are rules that you have to follow or you're wrong, you know, it's more that we are training to become aware of the suffering that comes from not doing, you know, what they invite you to do in practice. And one of those things is true love. So for me, um, I mean, I'm basically celibate, if I'm honest, obviously at the moment I'm in the monastery, but even the last five years practicing with these trainings, it basically helps you to practice stopping and um, not going with the urges of desire and kind of instant gratification, but really stop and look deeply at what is this desire? Where is it coming from? Is it coming from a childhood wound that you want to fix in the present moment? You know, or is it a love that actually is kind of quite, well, yeah, it's true love. It's not a need. It's just an offering, you know, because you're already offering it yourself and it's a grounded love. And so for me, I could see, well, no, you know, I'm in this grasping place. And so I need to practice to understand myself. It sounds cheesy, but really love myself, be a, a kind of lover to myself first. And that's what I, yeah. yeah, that is what I'm practicing today. It's very beautiful. Yeah. I'm still lost with all of this. Really? Years later. I mean, you know, it's like, it's true. It's, you said it almost sounds cheesy just because we use those big terms left and right, you know, and they kind of like lose their essence. And yet deep inside, there is something crazily true that we, you know, I, I do understand how one needs a practice to be reminded every day of what every it is day. to, you know, I'm currently with my parents which, you know, it's very difficult to be with your parents again. So, you know, and, and I have to learn every day accepting, again, we're back to these terms of acceptance. Yeah. Accept that things might not have been like I wanted them when I was 15, accepting that, you know, <clears throat> they might not be like I want them to be and accepting and accepting and, and this acceptance already is a lot of love. A lot that of love. That is love. That is love. Yeah. Well, they, yeah. That, I mean, it's in the training. I don't know if you've read them, but it describes true love as loving kindness, which is really friendship. Um, you know, it's I, not passion love, it's friendship, you know? You know that I did this documentary about Thich Nhat Hanh. Of course. I, yes, I'm very proud of, or at least I was not the filmmaker, but I was part of the team. And... Yeah. When we did this, I obviously got to read a lot and actually not so much reading, but to listen to him on YouTube, which I advise to anybody who's listening to us now and will listen to us in the future. I found so much peace every time I, I, had, I went on YouTube to listen to his talks about different uh, subjects. And one of his... Um, I guess, audible book or like, you know, spoken book kind of thing. Um, he had this beautiful definition of love, which was, and you stop me if I forget something or if I get it wrong, but in essence, it was the first, uh, the first was uh, loving kindness, which is in French is an amazing word that's called bienveillance, mm. which we 
almost like looking at the other with goodness, kind of. Mm. That that word to translate it literally. So mm. he talked about loving kindness. The second point was the, of the definition of true love was compassion. Yes. But if in Latin, in Latin, uh, compassion means suffering with or yeah. enduring, what Tai was saying, Thich Nhat Hanh seemed to be saying, is that it's an active process. It's not enough just to suffer with you almost have to bring the solution to someone. You have to be, yeah. so many couples where you've been together years and, and it's so hard to, to agree to stop and listen to the pain of your closest one and to take the time yeah. of oh, upset again or he's, up, oh, he's the, got this again. The, the true listening and trying to bring solutions was to the pain was compassion. And then the third point was, if I remember, joy. Yeah. There is no love without joy, right? Yeah. And the fourth one was uh, freedom. The freedom, which I understood as the freedom of becoming who you were always meant to be, kind of. Like, mm. your partner is not a limit to your... Because, you know, you're not trying to control the other. And therefore, he has the freedom to whatever that is. Yes. And I think another chapter, he concludes all of that by saying, loving is listening. Mm. Just listening. Yeah, right. It's, With your full presence. It, yeah. But you know no, the and teachings. I know. Does it make... Am I, yeah. am I talking? Yeah. Um, no, you're talking, yeah. Yeah, you're talking straight. Yeah. I mean, like you say, there's so many amazing resources that people can check out and get it from the horse's mouth. Yeah. You know, YouTube, there's a plum village... YouTube, there's a Plum Village app now, which is free, but they also invite donations because it's an amazing project. And but yeah, I mean, like you say, there's those those things and true love. Also, the last one in the kind of precept or the mindfulness training is equanimity. But you could call that freedom as well, because it, like you say, it's this ability to allow freedom to allow what is, you know, not to say, oh, I will love that bit about you, but I don't love that bit about you. You know, yes. oh, I love this person, but not that person. I mean, that's not love. That's all conditional. And this love that we practice to embody is is unconditional. You know, and it's kind of, and it's limitless as well. It's that's what's so beautiful about it. And um, and I guess here as well, yeah, we touch love in a different way. Because obviously, a lot of people say, well, how can you not have sex? Or like, how can you, you not have a partner? Like, it's very confusing for people because it's all we've been taught that love is. You know this kind of romantic love. Um, but I must say, I mean, I feel love in my body, you know, and, and obviously I have up and down, you know, my, I have good and bad days quote, cause it's life. But in terms of living a, among the sisters, there's so much love, you know, energetically and in our actions towards each other, so much kindness, so much care. And I think I shared to you as well, you know, it's so profound actually and intimate to just sit every day with the same people, you know, being present for ourselves and each other, to eat our breakfast together, to walk together, you know, to listen to each other. I mean, it, it is love. It's so beautiful. And then to open that space, you know, for all beings to drop into who may never have been listened to, who may not be accepted. Um, you know, it's just, I, I find it a very beautiful way to live. Yeah, as you speak, I'm wondering if I've ever had this kind of experience. Actually, it's very sad. You know, yeah, maybe, it is. maybe a glimpse of, I think, you know, not I think, I kind of know that in the Hindu tradition, you know, love, and that's at the source of what now is kind of called Tantra, but in a weird way, but at the source of it all is that, you know, like you can take a glimpse of, of the, you know, there, in true love and that's you know and it's not sexual and it's not fake intimacy it's like the true one and i you speak and i'm thinking i need to go to a monastery <laughs> <laughs> i need to do something you know you you wonder if have i really this kind of universal the, the universality of what love should be yeah that's, well what, uh, it could, what it has the capacity to be you know what we yeah. all have that capacity 
but I guess this is almost like a kind of social experiment to show people what's possible and to people to drop into that, but also then to embody it in the world and, and to build that community for each other, you know, um, mm. because I, I think that's the other thing to remember that we all have that capacity, but of course we're so, you know, we're so caught with this, this self, you know, which is, I, I love this definition, which is like a kind of bag of wounds and habits and views. And it's like, but underneath all of that is this kind of just presence and love. And so to be able to touch that um, yeah. is very profound, but and simple and fulfilling. That's the other thing. So I think you asked me, what's it like to be here and how's it helped me? I think the first thing that struck me when I came as a retreatant and then as a volunteer for the summer, doing all of this very like adrenaline fueled work, you know, like in the courts and yeah, social change and then being on stage as a musician and seeking all of this external validation that was meant to make me happy, you know, which is what we're told we'll do, we'll do and status and all this BS, you know, really um, not BS in it's fine to pursue those things. It's just, we don't need to, you know, and, and we might not touch the happiness that we might touch here, which is a very deep contentment. Yeah. So I remember just like sitting around with some people drinking gotcha. tea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the distraction you know, side of things is wrong, you know, like, yeah. Yeah, and just realising, hang on a minute, I'm really happy. Like, there's 100 people here, I know them, you know, I feel connected to them. I'm not, I'm nobody, it doesn't matter, no, it doesn't matter about my education, about my success, no success. Everyone, when we're here, some people are rich, some people are poor, like, it doesn't matter. We're just here together, and yeah, we're all doing our little job, pot washing, or cleaning the toilet, and then we eat together and, sit. and then it just makes you see how like as human beings yes we we don't need much to be happy we just need to be seen to be heard to be you know connect in this connection and again another part of the training is around healing nourishment and healing and inviting us not to drink alcohol and take drugs and run away from our feelings but to turn towards them to take care of them and to seek nourishment from the beauty of life that's already here so for example nature you know it's another big one bit looking at the trees and again for me it was just kind of, hang on a minute i've been pursuing all this stuff that's really stressful really exhausting really like carrot on a stick but all i need to do is like connect to myself and others that's that's true wealth you know that yes is true wealth. the healing part you're talking about i see every day in my practice of healing people with ayurveda um I feel like it's it's very weird how we there is a resistance instead of the acceptance there is a true resistance that the more I practice the more I can see it to 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 be within you know there was like I mentioned this it's not the first talk where I mentioned this but there was this uh, study where they place people you know and they have nothing 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 at all. And every now and then they just, they have electrodes, you know, plugged into themselves and they send like electric charges, like quite strong and it's painful. And at the end of the experiment, they ask people, what do you prefer to be, I'm, I'm cutting it short, but what do you prefer? And a staggering 80% prefer to get electric impulses mm. that takes the outside of this void. It's almost like you think, are we just so afraid of the emptiness and the silence because it brings us back to our, you know, like death, the void, the, 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 what's outside? You know, I'm, I'm going deep here. Mm. You have to wonder, I mean, why would you submit yourself to so much pain instead of being in silence? <laughs> the impossible stillness, you know, the stillness... Yeah the stillness the stillness that's required when you want to heal yes um, well, healing means looking inside and it is this, painful at the beginning it is painful, it is painful. especially There's at the beginning yeah just at the beginning then it goes away but you know even not so long ago i had like a bad tooth and and my friend did a sound healing on me mm. what did sound healing do it just took all this crap trying to take it out. And the pain was excruciating. Mm. For anybody 
that sound like, oh, she made it worse. No, she's just, you know, she was physically taking the pain out, helping me yes. get rid of the release. Pain. But yeah. yes, there is pain associated with looking inside, I think. Oh, huge, yeah. It's another huge misconception, isn't it? And I say a lot of my friends, I think, think that, you know, I'm on some kind of spa, you know, just chilling in uh, the village. It's so peaceful, but it's like, well, <laughs> it's it's both. It's heaven and it's hell because it's almost like, you know, nature gives us so much. I don't, we're all different, but for me, it really energizes me. And it's obviously the stillness outside supports the stillness within. And of course, a loving community around you, but you bloody need it when you start to do this practice, because what you're going to find is probably, um, you know, because we haven't been still for whole, whole lives, we've been rushing and running into projects, into becoming, 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 as we're told to become more than we are, be better than we are. Um, it's all ego. When you stop. Again. Yeah. Which is ego, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is a part of us, you know, which is fine for it to be there. You just don't want it running your whole life, you know, because uh, it's, yeah. it's going to take you to places you might not want to go. But, um, yeah, for sure, when, when the stillness, when there's stillness inside us and around us, it's almost like all this stuff that we've pushed away that we haven't a been able to be present with fully, it just starts to come up, you know, it comes up. And for me, then, the practice of mindfulness, you know, the guidance of, of the teachers here of Thich Nhat Hanh, he calls it like the art of suffering. So it's like we just learn how to be with these feelings, how to embrace them um, with support around us. But really, we're the ones turning towards this pain, which will be there. Life is full of suffering. and It's OK. It's just we need to learn how to be with it, to navigate it. You know, and that for yeah. me is what I'm learning here. Yeah. And feed the, feed the rumble is saying, why submit yourself to so much pain? Is a question is a question I ask during every romantic relationship that I've had so far. So I think that's the other pain that she's talking about. Um, well, he's wow, talking about this is a good question. Yeah, I think it's the I mean, ego. It's, it's like it's again. It's expectation. It's it's like the wound from the past is trying to control and that creates suffering. This is the suffering, I think, right? Yeah, I'm just sitting right. with that. Is I mean, I think that we can cause pain. I think there is pain that we haven't faced. Usually, I mean, what I'm looking at is it's kind of like there's all of these wounds that we gathered as children, which is quite normal. You can't grow up without trauma. Trauma isn't being hit by a car. Although I was once, actually. That's another story. <laughs> but, you know, it's these little, <laughs> these little things, you know. I mean, Peter Levine describes trauma as um, basically an event that happens without an empathetic witness. So it's mm. not even the event that happens because something can happen and we all respond differently. But it's if we weren't able to be... Yeah. Sorry, yeah. it's if, over. Yeah. I said the interpretation of that event. Yeah, the interpretation. The yeah. Yeah, and also, like, and I also think this is another gift of mindfulness. It's like training to be present with what is, with from a place of love. So when things happen, we are, we are the loving witness, you know, of accepting it and not, attaching it to ourselves, just allowing it to pass through. But all of this stuff that happened to us that we haven't allowed to pass through, that we've said, oh, this is my fault, you know, and I'm wrong, I'm not good enough, and not sharing that with someone or that someone not being empathetic and loving, again, feeling I'm there's something wrong with me. You know, this, these are deep traumas that need us to then at some point stop and acknowledge with our own loving awareness so that they can then be recognized basically and kind of embraced and to me that is the healing is just accepting what we are what has happened to us with love and, and that it's okay you know we don't have to be perfect we don't have to blame it's just allowing but then in relationships i mean it's true 
then we might be seeking love from the outside, uh, which actually isn't going to help um, necessarily. It, it may, but you know, you really need to learn to do that yourself. I think for me anyway, then we can be, you know, causing more pain in order to meet this deep need that we have in ourselves. It really is. Everything is really about becoming oneself, your truth and try it's, it's all about going back. Unfortunately, again, this doesn't tend to be 45 minutes. It never works. We have too much to <laughs> say all the time. We'll have to have to have session two because Talk it's a big, you. there are so many things, you know, that we can discuss, but it's just beautiful to have you. If you were to, but first of all, I would like to, for people who want to find you to know that all your links are on the, Facebook page for Tapua. You can sound at wondrousound.com. Um, and what do you have coming up? And you are you have an album that's out, right? So there's yeah, also yeah. The, <laughs> the link for your album. I think that would be beautiful if you want to. Would you like to to sing something for us before we have to? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Would you? Do yeah. you have your guitar? Yeah, I've got my guitar. The only thing is we might have to be a bit on an angle because my stand is uh, kind of taking a little yeah, nap don't worry. inside. But I think we can handle that, yeah. Yeah, so I was thinking I really wanted to offer a song today because that's, that's my bag. And um, this song's actually from an album that I wrote before, this one that's just come out. And it's, so it's called Courage. And it, it was, I wrote it when I was here actually for a 90 day rains retreat in 2019. And um, it's about really being aligned, yeah. And kind of living that truth and being prepared to start anew again and again in order to be in that space because it, it, we do have to do that, I think. It's not kind of, it's a moment to moment practice. Uh, it feels like the conclusion of this talk is really about acceptance shedding that ego which for me is if we want to simplify it is like everything that made up our identity and being open to to experience whatever and accept whatever comes with love really would that be a bit of a conclusion to all of this that sounds good to me <laughs> we're gonna listen to you then in the meantime okay great thanks Eve. thanks for having this lovely chat together Thanks to everyone who's joined us. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. All right. In this life of ours, give me courage. Not to hesitate to start anew with every corner of my heart in tune. Ooh, in this life of all. mistakes or start anew with every corner of our tune Ooh. Ooh. Ooh.
that the world. Oh, it's beautiful. And I'll see you for this talk. Thank you so much, so much, Ray. It's so beautiful. Again, I would have preferred to listen to this for hours now. <laughs> Very beautiful, very touching, and so fitting for our conversation. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And we'll have to talk again. Okay. I, <laughs> I, I, would I would love you to come back, and we can talk about your music and, you know, and the sound healing as well, I and mean, all these kind of things. And yeah, thank you so much was so helpful and enlightening really oh thanks Eva well, thanks for inviting yeah. me to yeah enjoy your your monastery lazy life day. your lazy day today yeah lazy exactly day. enjoy the lazy day yeah no plan you still work on on planting you, you work at the garden still yeah I'm on the happy farm that's my responsibility yeah I should do a bit of pot washing on the side you know yeah of course You're becoming an addict of pot washing. Be careful. I can't stop. Yeah. It's not very healthy. Anymore. <laughs> okay. Thank very you much so much. Love to you and everyone. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So much. Take Bye care. Bye for now. <laughs>